According to my schedule, I'm supposed to be building a budget PC today. So why is that box blue? Today's video is brought to you by Lexar and the NM610 PCI Express NVMe Drive. Available in 250GB, 500GB, and 1TB capacities, it makes the perfect upgrade for your laptop or desktop PC. Featuring NVMe 1.3 Gen 3x4 and speeds up to 3.5 times faster than SATA, it's the surefire way to supercharge your PC. Get into your games faster with the Lexar NM610 NVMe Drive. Click the link down in the video description to learn more. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. As I said, today I'm going to be putting together a budget PC. But, as we all know, the PC market is looking pretty bleak at the moment. Between the unavailability of all the new graphics cards and CPUs, to the inflated prices of just about every part, there's really nothing to get excited about in the PC space right now. Now, unfortunately, the budget on this computer right here is about $600. And if I'm being honest, that's a lot more than I would want to spend on this PC considering I built a $650 PC last year that might just kick the crap out of this thing. I'll get to the CPU here in just a second, but let's go through the rest of the parts first, starting with the MSI B460M-A Pro motherboard. The board itself is a pretty bone stock affair, with an LGA 1200 socket for Intel 10th generation processors, two DDR4 DIMM slots, a single PCI Express X16 slot for your graphics card, one M.2, HDMI output, and gigabit LAN. It is certainly not the most full-featured board that I've ever had on this channel, but at $73, I think this will do the job just fine. For system memory, Deal was kind enough to send over their 16GB kit of Orion DDR4 3200MHz RAM, and this should be a perfect match for this kit. However, keep in mind that on the B460 chipset, you are going to be limited to a 2933MHz speed. More on that later. For storage, I'm going with a 480GB Kingston M.2 SATA SSD. Now, when I bought this SSD, it was only about $45. However, today it's running about $78. So, your mileage may vary on the price there. The case for today, I'm sure you're more than tired of seeing, and at this point, as am I, but I didn't have any other Micro ATX cases on hand. So, we're reusing the Ventru Dark Flash Micro ATX case in white with a kit of Antec 120mm fans on board. And now I'll talk about the CPU. In this case, I picked up an Intel i3-10100F. Now, the CPU is a very recent addition to Intel's 10th generation lineup on the LGA1200 socket. It is a 4-core, 8-threaded CPU with a 3.6 GHz base clock and a 4.3 GHz max turbo. Now, like Intel's other CPUs, with the part number ending in F, this CPU has no onboard graphics, meaning you will need to install a graphics card into your PC. And given we're building a gaming PC, I feel that was pretty obvious. And of course, all that leads to the question of, which graphics card did I choose today? I'm going to be perfectly honest, I really considered going all Mr. Turner on everyone and saying, this is where my graphics card would go, if I had one. Let's be honest, the only graphics card that I could find brand new at a reasonable price right now is the XFX RX 580. And in fact, the last time I built a system in this PC, I used the XFX RX 580, so I wasn't going to do that again. There is one other card that is selling for retail price, and it is the GTX 1650. Not even the GTX 1650 Super, because those are selling for about $300. But you can pick up a GTX 1650 right now for about $170, which is fairly reasonable. Now, if you've been watching my channel for some time, you know my relationship with the GTX 1650. I actually do like this card if it's used in the right circumstances, and it is still far and away better than the GTX 1050 Ti. Which, by the way, while I was searching for a graphics card for this build, you can still buy a GTX 1050 Ti for the same retail price that it launched at, making this actually a pretty good deal. Although, you should still probably buy that RX 580. Power supply is going to be, honestly, whatever I dig out of my closet, because those are prohibitively expensive too right now. I know, I'm really selling you on this build so far, but I am genuinely excited to see what the Intel i3-10100F can do. So, let's get this thing together, and I'll see you after the build montage.
So this is the card that just loves to hate me. Uh, so this is the GTX 1650, and it's supposed to be in the system right now. But as you can see, it's obviously not. That's because the first uh, hour or so after I put the system together, this became more of a troubleshooting video. I managed to get Windows installed and even got a couple of Cinebench runs in before the problem started. But as soon as the NVIDIA driver was installed, the system would just randomly blue screen on me. I eliminated the memory right away and then focused on the video card. And with the video card removed or the driver not installed, the system ran just fine. So I swapped it out for a GTX 1066 gig. Now, seeing as we're not gonna do a lot of graphics testing in this video today, that should do us just fine. Another difficulty with this build is you might notice the fans are not spinning inside of here. Well, actually only one of them is besides the CPU. That's because the MSI B460M Pro motherboard only has two fan headers. Two. There's a CPU fan header and a system fan header right next to it. And even on a budget motherboard, that feels a little bit underwhelming to me. But let's move on to the interesting bit in this video. And that is, what do I think of the all new budget CPU from Team Blue? I've got to say, I'm pretty impressed. Starting with Cinebench R15, I know, I know, I'm going to be redoing all of my CPU tests inside of R20 here very shortly. I promise. Here, the i3-10100F scores impressively well. In both single-threaded and multi-threaded performance, it outclassed every single 4-core Ryzen CPU that I've benchmarked thus far. In fact, in single-threaded performance, the i3 comes within spitting distance of the Ryzen 5 3600, which is my favorite CPU of the last 18 months all while costing less than half of what the Ryzen 5 3600 does, even in the best of times. 3D Mark Firestrike and TimeSpy both back up these results in their physics testing, with the i3 scoring within a couple percentage points of the top four core CPUs that I've tested at stock speeds. But therein lies the rub. See, at just $85, this is a fantastic CPU. Even under Cinebench workloads and less than ideal air conditions, thanks to the MSI Pro motherboard, we peaked at just 63 degrees Celsius with the Intel stock cooler on there. While gaming, the CPU hovered in the high 40s and low 50s. So not only do you not have to go out and buy a third party cooler, these results weren't even with the fan at 100%. In fact, it never even attempted to ramp up beyond what you hear right here. But there are some major issues holding the CPU back, it feels like, and it all has to do with Intel's arbitrary tiering system for both CPUs and chipsets. For example, this Giel Orion memory, which is rated for 3200 MHz at CAS 16. And I've tested that on a Ryzen 7 3800 XT to some beautiful results. However, unless you pony up for a Z490 motherboard, you're going to be locked at 2666 MHz. But let's say you did decide to upgrade to the cheapest Z490 motherboard that I could find which, by the way, is still double the price of this MSI. At least you'd be rewarded with some CPU and memory overclocking options, right? Well, for the memory, you could overclock to your heart's content. However, on the CPU side of things, unless you have an Intel K-series CPU, the multiplier is still locked, meaning the i3-10100F is leaving a lot of performance on the table. I am still going to recommend the Intel i3-10100F at $85. That is, if you can find one at that price, because I had to backorder mine and it still took seven weeks to arrive. The 10100F is still a fantastic value, but it is a little frustrating to look over and see what is essentially an i7-7700K sitting in your system and knowing it will never reach its full potential. If you want to pick up any of the hardware from today's video, I will have Amazon affiliate links down in the video description. And on your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter, at Craft Computing, and if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining either the Patreon or Float Plane. Links are also down in the video description. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Alright, I'm going to bed. It's one in the morning. We're gonna start doing some seasonal beers here on Craft Computing, starting with the New Belgium Accumulation, a white IPA at 6.2%. Very light color. Um, not quite a lemonade yellow. Think like a crystal light IPA. How's that? That is interesting in a very, very good way. It's definitely an IPA but there's this rich malt flavor that goes all the way through it. Oh, that is delicious. Boy, the hops in this are not too intense, but very, very good. This is not a rich, punchy-in-the-mouth, West Coast-style IPA. 
This is something that is very approachable. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of a hopped pilsner. Uh, it's, it's not, L let's not confuse the terms here. This is a white IPA. There are hops in here, but it's not, like I said, it's not the West Coast style IPA, but it's also not the East Coast style IPA, more of the earthier vegetal kind of tastes. This is very approachable. Um, it tastes very much like a Pilsner. It's crisp, it's refreshing, but the reason I call it kind of like a Pilsner is there's this weird malty flavor that's, that's kind of bready but it's not that normal biscuit flavor that you get out of a Pilsner. It's it's like a fresh roll of sourdough. Like it, it's a very light, but still very malty flavor that's coming through. And it's just good. <laughs>